And we're live with Transform Your Relationships, live. I'm Laura Rubenstein here with the amazing Dr. Roberta Shaler. Hi, Roberta. Hi, Laura. It, this is going to be quite a day because we're going to talk about something that people think they know what it means. And we are going to talk in depth about what it really does mean. Yeah, we're going to talk about that big C codependency word. <laughs> a lot of people throw it around. Um, a lot of people don't even know what it is. Other people are in it and are blind to it. So we hope to pull back the covers and really give some, shed some light on the situation and talk about the dark parts of it too. Yeah, I wish there are many. <laughs> yeah, it's not the, the, the funnest thing, especially if you're living it right now. Yeah, if you get trapped into it, if you, you know, you sometimes you just kind of slowly approach it and you move it a little bit. And then when you get deeply into it, it starts to really warp you. And some people are happy in that situation. But, you know, we want to know that for healthy relationships, it's not this way. There's not one person leaning on another. It's not two people leaning on each other. It's two healthy people who then are totally independent. And then you join together to make each better and greater than the sum of their parts, but still perfectly fine and managing and coming together to be stronger. And that's really important for us to understand because codependency is excessive emotional or psychological reliance on another person. And it kind of sometimes I think in the beginning of a relationship can feel very comfortable and very needed and wanted and loved on both sides, right? They're both getting these needs met of emotional connection, what feels like emotional connection. Yes, you know, it, it's... Is similar, like I did on my podcast this week, I was talking about isolation as a part of coercive control. And just like you said, in both those cases, in the beginning, when you think you're building something healthy, it's flattering. It's, oh, you think I can help you with that? Well, that's lovely. Oh, you're supporting me. I feel really good. And it sounds and looks like healthy beginnings of a relationship. But it's not until you start to feel the resentment and the emotional heaviness and the, <clears throat> you know, that this is, this is difficult, that you start realizing something's off here. And yes, it may meet your need to have somebody who depends on you for their emotional well-being. But after a while, that's a bit of an albatross. You know, it's just weighing you down. And you, when you realize that, then sometimes you don't feel like you can stop because you've been shoring that person up so much that if you if you stop, they're going to fall. Mm. And so that's an important consideration for people getting out of a relationship where they real, realize that they're being enabling and, and there is codependency going on. And codependency is really something that morphed from, from the substance abuse world into more general parlance and so it's it's a bit of a spillover but no matter what it's dysfunctional yeah i mean i think i've seen people where it's almost their purpose to be feel needed and to help people and they fall prey there's like this fine line between having a purpose to help people and being an used <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah well, I think we have to call that that the way it is, because, you know, when you step back from it and you look at the dynamics, yes, it can be all sweetness and light and rainbow and unicorns and, oh, that person needs so much help. But then when you find out that that person is going to need that help forever and ever and ever, <laughs> um, that then it gets a little bit heavy. And what we're talking about basically is one-sided relationships where one person is always doing the leaning and the other person's always doing the shoring up. And that gets very tiring and can lead, as I said, to resentment. And then you think, 
and here's the unhealthy pattern. When you get some resentment, you think, oh, I'm not a very good person. You know, I shouldn't feel resentment because a good person wouldn't. This person needs me. And so it's a bit like, you know, having a debt and you can't pay it. So you take out your credit card and then you can't pay it. And then there's interest on it and you still can't pay it. You know, you're just getting heavier and heavier all the time. So from being being used or being needed so much or feeling like you're never doing it well enough or what or that it never end you know like this person never changes they never there's i can pour everything i have into them and they're still needy they still need shoring up and this is where this is where the separation in our heads has to come from between the substance abuse model Mm. And when we're talking about emotionally, like when it made that shift over there, because, you know, it is the same model in some senses, but somebody who has addictive behaviors, that that's a, a very specific application of that model because anybody can do something about their self-esteem. It's very difficult sometimes to do something about an addictive behavior where you have physiological things going on as well, right? So you have these cravings and all, whereas in a psychologically, emotionally needy person, those things can be changed. Um, and both people on either definition have to be willing to make the change, but that's where the difficulty lies. You know, people who are emotionally codependent often don't want to recognize that. And people who are emotionally enabling sometimes feel powerful. They feel like, well, this person really needs me, you know, and I have power over this person because if I don't do it and I threaten to walk away, then that person needs me more, right? And then we get into the whole hijackal realm, which we talk about so often. So it gets very lopsided. Yeah. And I think you make a really good distinction because we're talking about the, the subject of demystifying codependency. And we started out talking about not in the uh, addiction model. We're talking about in the relationship model of codependence, but there's overlap. There's definite overlap. But what I heard you say is it's much more difficult when there's an addiction because that is a condition that is really hard to overcome. Whereas it's not that it's easy to overcome your self-esteem as a codependent, but it, if you acknowledge it, that you're in this pattern, you're not, there's not a chemical part of your body that's addicted. There may be a chemical brain chemistry thing that is, but it's not addicted to a substance. It's addicted to a thought pattern and an emotional way of being. Right. Versus, right. It's, yeah. it's easier to understand that I can improve my own self-esteem than it is to understand that I can extricate my body from the craving for a substance. Right. I hear, hear that. So let's break it down because we've been using two terms pretty uh, differently, codependent and enabler. There's two people. The enabler is the one who props the codependent up. Is that what you were saying? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the enabler, yeah. The enabler, mm -hmm. that puppet, and then the the uh, codependent is this one. Mm. Yeah, the, the codependent is the leaning and, and the enabler is the allowing to lean. Okay, so this is the codependent. This is codependent. This okay. is the enabler. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, enabler is the strong. But eventually it looks like this, right? Because right. they meet each other. And so they're propping each other up in very different ways. Right. And that's that's like a house of cards because it can fall. And like you said, when you're interdependent, you can stand on your own, come together, breathe, come together, breathe. <laughs> you know, it's like a, it's a flow. It's a dance. It's a, it's a beautiful connection knowing that even when you're on your own, you've got this loving energy in your life. Um, and it's not, they're not there because they need you. They're there because they're there. They want to be there. <laughs> they want to be there. They're, it's just the choice of the, the time. And, and maybe it doesn't have as much um, angst and energy, energy. It has as much energy, but it doesn't have the angst in it, I guess. Yes, and I, I think it has peace in it because you know that you're perfectly all right on your own. 
So you're not, you know, doing sort of cell phone surveillance. Um, where are you? When are you coming home? What, how long is it going to take you? No, you know, they generally come home sometime between five and six and all is cool, right? Big difference. And so it, energetically, it's quite different. Yeah, very different. And so if somebody is wondering if they're in an interdependent versus a codependent, What's the telltale signs? Oh, big question. I mean, first of all, look at your energy use. If there's if you if, if there is this feeling when you're going home, like, oh, right? Like, uh, what's gonna be happening now? What are they gonna need now? What haven't I done now? What what how do I have to constantly prop them up? When am I gonna get something? When is somebody going to support me? When is someone going to be interested in me? I walk in the door and all I get is, oh, it's been a terrible day, and I'm I'm so glad you're here because I can't deal with it. Well, if that's the kind of energy exchange that you're having, that you already know that you're using so much emotional energy to prop another person up, that's a pretty good sign. And if you're, um, if if the person keeps being irresponsible, um, and they're engaging in as you know some underachieving behavior, and then they give you all these reasons all the time, and you get to the point of thinking. Is this ever going to change? Hmm. It seems like there's like an element of whining or something in the relationship. Well, it's, it's, I think neediness is something that everybody feels the heaviness of. You know, if you, if you are in a place where you feel super needy, you're not happy about it. And if you're with somebody who feels super needy, you're not happy about it. Right. And so energetically, if you've got that weight of neediness, like, I don't think I can function without you. Um, that's, that's not a great empowering place to be. And if you're propping somebody up all the time, you don't have an equal reciprocal mutual partner. So that's not something you want to be engaging in for very long. I mean, obviously there's give and take in every relationship, but we're talking about the overall pattern. Right. And the overall pattern has this energy of neediness in it from both sides in a way. And then this, but do you think both sides have a, a part of dread other, or just the enabler? No, I think the, the dread is on both sides, but very different. The codependent dreads the person not taking care of them. They're very anxious. The person will not fulfill their needs. And the person who is having to fulfill the needs dreads being needed that much. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, of course, as you said, you're absolutely right. It's like, oh, it's nice to be needed. It's nice. And then we, we mistake that for being wanted. And we have to make that distinction between being needed and being wanted. And, and it's a very fine edge because sometimes it is nice to be needed, to know you're the only person that can, can make that person stay or, or lift them up or whatever. But if they are using that and they never change or get better, that's the telltale sign. Mm -hmm. The dynamic, all the energy you're pouring into it is not changing the dynamic of the relationship in a positive way. And all their energy is about justifying the way they are <laughs> and why they need you or why they, why they need, can't change, why they can't change. Yeah. Like, well, if you'd had my parents, you wouldn't be able to do it either. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. Hey, I did have your parents snap out of it, but <laughs> you know, um, but you can't do that. That's unkind. So you have to learn to be very, um, much in that model that I talk about all the time, learn to communicate in ways that are totally kind and totally honest at the same time. And you need to have boundaries because codependents have no boundaries, right? And, and if you get into aspects of people pleasing, you know, you're going to have problems with that. And if you're overly reactive, like, um, <sighs> Oh, you'll never guess what someone's. I remember Laura was, um, Charles and I went to be um, acting, uh, managing directors of a company in Manhattan. Then the owner of the company would come and say, Oh, well, that employee said they're not happy. What are you going to do about it? 
And I would have to say to her, because she'd have her knickers totally in a twist. And, I, and Charles and I would say to her constantly, all right, just take a breath. It's only information. It doesn't mean you have to do anything about it. It's just information. But overly reactive people, like everything is is a big deal. Everything is a tempest in a teacup. Oh, that person doesn't like me. Oh, I could just tell that they don't want me around. Oh, you know, and you're like, oh, for heaven's sakes, that person's having a bad day. It has nothing to do with you. Right. Um, and so you get that fatigue that comes from that. Oh, yes. I've been present to that. I had never thought of it when somebody is so worried about how others think about them and they have to pretzel themselves. They feel this incredible pressure to withhold or not do anything to upset other people. Is that a classic, uh, what, enabler? <laughs> well, it's a classic people pleaser. You know, people like pleaser, yeah. I'm, I'm going to prop you up. I'm going to make you like me. How do you like me so far? If I do put my, make myself into a pretzel, does that work for you? You know, if I'm all misshapen over here, but are you happy? You know, um, that's where we get into really disastrous dynamics. Hmm. And we have to be careful about that because it, it's it's dysfunctional. And, and the more that we get into the patterns, the more of a rut we create. And then we wonder how deep that rut is and whether we can get out. And yes, you can always get out, but you're going to feel very unkind when you do it. Um, I can think of several people who I've seen in this rut and they are very comfortable in the rut. Like it could, it's unfathomable to think about any place else. They've made their home in their little rut. And yeah, so absolutely. And you put two ends on it and it's a coffin, <laughs> you know? Um, and, you know, if people are comfortable with it, if you get into a situation where, you know, there's the two people are happy with it, it's fine. It's not your relationship. They're happy in it. But if people find that they're resentful or they're upset or they feel it would be unkind, like this person really needs me, I can't leave them now. Well, that, it's one thing if they're having a health challenge. It's another thing if that's their daily operational system. That's just the way they are, right? right? So it's difficult to calibrate. I understand that. And healthy, well-meaning people have empathy. And so they'll go the extra mile for someone. They'll, they'll uh, give people the benefit of the doubt and they'll work it through. And then somehow it becomes a pattern. And if it becomes a pattern and it starts to weigh heavy on you and you find resentment bubbling up and then you find yourself saying, Oh, well, a good person wouldn't feel resentment because this person really needs needs me. Then you're getting into a cycle of a downwards tailspin. Yeah. And so that's where where I think your word boundaries comes in, right? And once you identify the pattern and you know it's going in a downwards cycle, and that could be at the very beginning or it could be years down the road, what is the next step? to like start saying, whoa, I need to, I need to get back to me. I need to get out of this pattern. Gosh, what the heck do I do? <laughs> you know, well, I'm the first step is exactly what you're saying is to focus on you. Like what, what's going on for me? Do I feel this is healthy? Am I losing myself? Am I being overburdened? Do I feel overburdened? What's overburdening me? Why do I feel that I have to keep meeting these needs? Mm. Why do I feel only me can meet these needs? Because that's not true. You know, and if, if you're healthy, you will say, no, there are many people who could meet these needs. Why am I being the one? And do I want to continue being the one? And then, because it always starts with self-reflection, you know, it's really important. In my membership program, um, and, and for other people as well. We just launched our first course in the series of uh, helping people with very particular pieces of thought. And then, then I've, I've actually taken my podcast and I've 
I've written them out, not just a transcription, but written them out and then ask personal reflection questions to go really deeply into that specific thing. How does that work for you? And so I encourage people always to not jump into the huge puddle, but just put on your galoshes and find a little puddle to um, to say, all right, what about this piece? What could I do? And that's where you start with the boundaries. You know, people get afraid of boundaries because they think I'm going to make these grand proclamations that, no, you will not do this in my presence anymore. <laughs> but actually, you have to start with little things like, you know, that doesn't work for me really well. What would work for me is this. Could we try that? You know, it's gentle. You don't have to be like some kind of Godzilla that comes out and says, now I have boundaries. You know? I think when people say that, like, oh my God, I need to set a boundary here. Their anger is at themselves because they haven't done it, but it comes out sideways because they just got so frustrated yeah. at the fact they allowed that. And now they realize they have to do something about it. Yeah. But I love the idea of using kind communication to say, okay, well, now that I get it, what I've done, I've done, I've taken responsibility, I need to correct it. And how can I do that in a gentle, kind way and keep reinforcing it? Kind of like a puppy dog. I like to use a puppy dog example. You're trying to train it to pee on the mat or go outside or whatever. And you're like, over here, puppy. And then the puppy pees. You can you can be as angry as you want at that puppy, but the puppy's a puppy just being a puppy. Right? So mm -hmm. might as well just say, keep. you just got to keep repeating it and keep setting that that guideline, yeah. you know, well, like, I, I, I used that example long ago when we talked about boundaries right. and, and basically what, what the, the, um, the thought pattern behind it is that you just have to keep picking the puppy up and putting it on the pee right. pad. Right. Right. And not saying bad puppy, bad puppy, bad puppy. No, we do it over here. No, we do it over here. Mm -hmm. And that's basically a boundary that says, no, if you want to be around me, this is the way it needs to go. And it's not being demanding. It's just being clear. Like for us to interact and for us to feel like we could have equality, reciprocity, and mutuality, this is me. This is, this is who I am and this is what works for me. Let's see if we can find a way to respect that. And it's not heavy. I mean, it's not terrible. I know someone wrote the other day and they said, well, I don't even know where to start with boundaries. And I said, start with little things, you know, where would you like to go for dinner? Don't say, oh, I don't know, whatever you like, because you just, you know, I mean, for me, I just don't care. So I, <laughs> I, I, I don't care where we go. But if you do care and you don't say, start by saying, right? Start to build that muscle of saying, well, I kind of feel like Thai food. How about you? So you put forward a suggestion because you're afraid of rejection. You have to build up this muscle that will allow you to set boundaries. So you can start in these small ways just by saying, well, I think Thai would be great. What do you think? And then they say, oh, I had Thai for lunch. I want to go for Chinese. And say, oh, okay. Well, maybe go for Thai next week and let's do Chinese tonight. Now you've started to say, okay, it's all right for me to say I, I wanted Thai food and, and be able to negotiate and end up with Thai food another day. And so you start in these small ways of just saying it's okay for me to have a, a want or a need or to be able to express what I prefer. And then I can work up to saying, you know, for us to stay in a relationship, I need to feel respected. And here are the ways I feel respected. And so you give that information in my infamous personal weather report um, and you let the person know what would work. And then you observe whether or not there's direct that that taken in any direction from that and are moving well towards something that would work for both of you. But boundaries is like so many people feel like that means that I'm going to dismiss people. Or I'm going to be harsh on people. No, it means you're going to be clear about yourself. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> and, you know, cause I've seen, and you talked about the small ways to do it. 
but actually that's where you can really notice when you're not willing to do it. I know that it's especially in new dating relationships or even two, three, four, five, six year old relationships, um, deferring to the other person becomes a habit and they may think, oh, I really want Thai, but even if I suggest it, I'll probably be knocked down. So I'm not going to even bother. There becomes a pattern um, because that was, that's it's been established already. Right. And so then using that wise example, then you just say, you know, I brought up Thai several times today. I would like Thai. Let's go there. So then you become assertive. Oh, and that's okay, right? Being assertive is okay. Assertive is okay as long as you're only speaking about yourself and you do not mention another human by name or pronoun. So I say, I would really like Thai today. It's something I've been looking forward to. Um, let's do that. And the person may say, well, you know, you, uh, you know, I think it's my turn and I'd like to have Thai food. So you, you start building those muscles that say, you're allowed to know what you think, feel, need, want, prefer, and remember, <laughs> you know? You are allowed <laughs> and you can even express if it means that. You have to be uncomfortable because sometimes people don't even want to deal with that discomfort of confrontation or conflict, yeah. potential conflict. And they are conflict avoiders at all costs. And right. that's when you get into this really like, okay, I'm going for Thai, but I don't really want to go Thai. And I get to have my way. You know, there's just like. Yeah, there's and, going to be some equality here. You know, and, because and, people. And, you know, one or both may not even understand that in the, that you're in that, that pattern of right. no equality. Mm -hmm. Like it's just this pattern that is running in the, in the, in the relationship because that's what it's always been. And one is conflict averse and the other one feels like is it's comfortable with assertion maybe. Mm -hmm. And codependency and, in its basic nature is people pleasing. You know, mm -hmm. so, so whatever you want, because I don't matter, you know, <laughs> um, because you're dependent on the other person for your emotional or self-esteem needs. Well, or whatever you want, because I'm serving and that's my purpose. I feel like that's what I'm here to do. You know, I know a lot of, I, well, not a lot of, I've seen people who are religious get into that pattern because mm -hmm. that's, they feel like they have to be of service and not get in anyone's way and this is being a good person in their religion type of thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's nowhere in any religion that says be a doormat. <laughs> you know, um, people, I was talking with someone the other day who wanted to express her spiritual beliefs. And, and I said to her, I, I don't think there's any, any, scripture that I know of that says, oh, allow yourself to be abused. It's okay. And immediately she brought up the Bible and said, well, turn the other cheek. N no, no, that's not about abuse. That is to say, you know, all right, if somebody does something, you, you are not condoning the behavior, but you're saying, all right, I see the behavior. And then you can take action and move away from the behavior yeah. um, and speak up about the behavior because all these things are taken out of context <laughs> to serve somebody's purpose, right? right. <laughs> um, so it's important to recognize that the codependent is seeking someone else to tell them all the time what to do and that they're okay. And a person who has hijackal tendencies goes, oh, live one here. Easy to control, easy to manipulate, easy to run their life. And so one is control, controlling by being so needy. The other one is controlling by knowing you need me so much that I will withhold things in order to control you. Mm. You get into a very, very negative dynamic that way. But it's important for us to realize that we're responsible for our own self-esteem. And in this conversation today, we want to be supporting you to say, okay, if I don't feel good about myself, 
I should be looking in the mirror and working on that or getting to work with a therapist who can help me, but not looking for a partner who is going to take care of me because that is not going to be a healthy, independent person coming to a relationship that will, by its nature, provide equality, reciprocity, and mutuality. Yeah. And if you don't have that and you want to start it, it starts with oneself. You can't fix or change another person. Um, That's so you right. Start, you know, start getting the help for yourself, and then, yeah. um, then you can make some choices and if that person comes along for the ride, great. If they don't, they don't, you know, and that's more choices to be made. Um, yeah. And you talk about, you talked about the personal weather report. Is that in your book, Kaizen for Couples? It certainly is. And <laughs> put that on the screen for people. <laughs> yeah. Um, Kaizen for Couples. Um, steps to save, sustain, and strengthen your relationship. There are two chapters in there. The reason that I created it was we need a clear way to communicate that does not impute blame or shame. So to know that we're 100% able and in within our rights to say what we think, feel, need, want, prefer, and remember is a big step. Because if you don't believe that you have the right to just say, I prefer Thai, you actually say, well, what do you want? Well, I don't know. What do you want? You know, we become like those vultures in the jungle book. What do you want to do? Well, I don't know. What do you want to do? Right? <laughs> we just get into this strange relationship. So if you start to learn that, okay, what do I really want? What do I prefer? What do I need? What do I think? What do I feel? <laughs> and, you know, first of all, get clear within yourself and then accord yourself the right because you breathe and take up space on this earth. You have the right to say that as long as you do not mention another human by name or pronoun. You know, like I need this, so you should do that. No, you stop at I know I need this. So you broadcast that out and you see where it lands. You see if someone's that person's listening and you, you see if that person takes it in and changes the behavior. And if they don't, then you say, I need this. And, you know, here's what it means to me. And or, here's what it means to being in relationship. You know, you set a boundary by saying what you need. Then you see if anybody's listening. Then if they are, are listening, then you just say oh, wow that feels really good i'm so glad you heard me and you reinforce that but if they ignore you and nothing happens then you up the ante by saying you know here is my boundary and here's the consequence if it isn't met and that needs a, a little more self-confidence than just saying what you prefer and so you work at it in those steps so that you become okay nobody died it's okay <laughs> you know i got to say that you know, yeah i'm still alive i'm still breathing it might have been a little anxious but i did it and and then you start taking up your own space to which you're entitled in this world mm. you know you're not here to be a doormat you're not here to be anybody's cat toy um so it's okay for you to say what you want or what you need as long as you're not blaming and shaming. And that's what the personal weather report is about. So there are whole two chapters, how to give a personal weather report and how to respond to one. It's so powerful. I know it can change. And it's a, it also helps the whole mental way of thinking about yourself. When you mm. stop the blame and the internal shaming and the blaming and the judging and the critiquing, now you actually can take on your power versus give it away to somebody because all of those are giving your power away to people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So when we're looking at this codependency enabler model, um, you know, it gets really muddy. Who's who sometimes, <laughs> um, but we end up like this. And when you end up like this, nobody feels good. Everybody's a little flattened. Everybody knows that if you give this up, the whole house of cards is going down. If you've had to be this, upright person for somebody to lean on and the relationship is dependent on that 
then you need to know that you you've got to sort of back off a little and they slip a little and then you see what happens so either they're going to keep slipping or they're going to start saying oh you know i better come up and and be a partner Mm -hmm. And so th these these things are all very instructional. <laughs> and if you're if you're awake to it and you're ready to change and you're ready to have the dynamics be different, you can affect those changes. But if you're stuck in a pattern, you really need to see the pattern. There's so much freedom in it. It's really scary. But if you do it with some support, I know you offer a ton of support on your website or relationshiphelp.com, um, it doesn't have to be insurmountable. It actually can be the, the journey of a lifetime. Yeah. You know, that's why, that's what the word Kaizen means. Small, positive, incremental improvements. Not a wholesale change. <laughs> Little tiny things that build up to something that's a solid foundation. Yes. Well, it's been a very rich conversation demystifying codependence the enabler the codependent being how do you get to interdependence um thank you everyone for watching thank you roberta for being thank here thank you laura great ideas we had a great conversation i hope everybody got something of value from it yes enjoy your day bye bye <laughs>